الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد This phrase الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده It is the common way that علماء preachers, دعاء teachers have begun their lectures for the last 1,440 years الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام عَلَى مَنْ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدَهِ And may peace and salat and salam be upon the one after whom there is no Nabi. This is the way you begin any talk across the Muslim world for 14 centuries. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, we're going to continue what I left off in part one, the red line. Yes, we preach tolerance. Yes, we preach as much as we can, unite the ummah. But there must be red lines. And today I'm going to mention another sensitive red line. Once again, lots of issues happen, but we have to preach the truth regardless of what happens. And that is going to be the red line of the nubuwa of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the finality, the khatam of that nubuwa. I just recited for you in salah, in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِجَالِكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, is not the father of any man amongst you. وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ But he is the Rasul of Allah. He's higher than a father. He's not just a father. He is Rasul Allah. And he is خَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Khatam, in the Arabic language, when you finish writing a document, you close it up. You put a wax seal on it to seal the document. You know, back in the day, the kings and emperors would have a ring. And that ring would be their khatam. And they would dip it in wax. And then they would put that wax onto the document that it's not going to be touched. It is complete. It is finished. You cannot make an addition once you put the khatam on there. The document is done. Nobody can touch it after that once the khatam has been put on. And our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is called the khatam, the seal. There's going to be nothing after him. And this concept of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being khatamun nabiyin, being the Nabi after whom there is no Nabi, it is a concept that is explicitly proven in the Quran, in numerous traditions, by the unanimous consensus of the Sahaba and by the unanimous consensus of the entirety of the Ummah. There are so many traditions about this. In Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي There will be no Nabi after me. And also in Sahih Bukhari, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that before the Day of Judgment, ثَلَاثُونَ دَجَّالُونَ كَذَّابُونَ are going to come. Thirty Dajjals, all of them liars are coming. Why did he call them Dajjal? Dajjal, by the way, is the worst liar. Dajjal, Dajjala is to deceive. Dajjal, the deceiver. You cannot get a worse verb in the Arabic language to talk about lying, slandering, buhtan. This is Dajjal. Dajjal, the one who is the worst. And why did our Prophet say he's a Dajjal? كُلُّهُمْ يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ نَبِي وَأَنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَ بَعْدِي The reason why he called them Dajjal is because they are going to claim they are Nabi. And I am telling you, there is no Nabi after me. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. And I can go on and on. Really, the evidences don't need to be mentioned. Wallahi, because this is grade one stuff. This is, there is no controversy about this. Before the coming of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the Arabian Peninsula, nobody declared he's a Nabi. The concept of Nubuwa was not known to the Arabs. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, I am a Nabi, actually some of the new people said, what is a Nabi? Wama Nabi? They didn't know the concept. The Prophet ﷺ explained to them, Nabi Anba'anillah, Allah has given me information to worship Allah alone, to destroy the idols. Now, after the Prophet ﷺ, when he was so successful, we believe, by the way, this is a sign of truth, that there was no 
fad of anbiya before the Prophet. There's no, you know, political career. There's no wave of people saying they're anbiya. He's coming the first of the Arab anbiya. There is no Arab anbiya before him. There's nobody who spoke Arabic and who was a Nabi before the Prophet ﷺ. Now, what's going to happen when he is successful? What's going to happen when an empire is built? Dajjalun, kathabun are going to want to try to get that power. That wealth, even though the Prophet didn't do it for power or wealth, but there will be false claimants. And so, in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, this began. It became a fad, a rawaj. In Arabic, even rawaj and Udu is the same thing. It became a fad. It became something that every evil leader wanted to tap on to this new idea called Nubuwa. Let me see, maybe I can be a king, maybe I can have political power. And in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the false people, Musaylama, began to say, I am a Nabi. And he had some bizarre Quran, you know, Al-Filu, Mal-Filu, Madraka, Mal-Filu. He just copied the Quran, he just changed some words, you know. And he wrote to the Prophet ﷺ, Allah has made you a Nabi in the Quraysh. He's made me a Nabi in my tribe. So you have half the earth, I'll have the other half. You take half of the earth, I'll have the other half. And the Prophet Sallallahu called him Dajjal and called him Musaylama Al-Kathab. You are the Kathab. You are a liar. I am Khatib Al-Anbiya'i wa Nabiin. So the Prophet predicted and it happened in his own lifetime. And then as soon as, you know, uh, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ passed away immediately, you had Sajjah, you had uh, 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 Al-Aswad Al-Anasi, you had multiple people. It just became a fad. Every major political leader, every major false person who wanted power began to claim this. And throughout the early Umayyads and Abbasids, multiple times, every few decades, another person would come along saying, oh, now I am being inspired. Wahi is coming to me. In fact, the early Umayyads and the early Abbasids is well known. They would take these people, put them on trial, and give them the punishment that is due unto them. Uh, interesting anecdote in Abu Hanifa's lifetime, Imam, Imam Al Azam, in Abu Hanifa's lifetime, Rahimallahu Ta'ala, a man uh, claimed that he was a prophet in Baghdad. And so a person came to Abu Hanifa and said, Oh, Abu Hanifa, you know, so and so, he claims he is a, a, a Nabi and he has, uh, you know, mu'jizat and whatnot. Abu Hanifa, his face changed. He became extremely angry. Listen to this. He said, Anybody who dares ask him for his miracles, thinking that he might have some, he is a kafir. You don't even have to ask. Anybody who goes to this man saying, okay, let me see what are your mu'jizat. Let me see what have you, what is the wahi? What do you have? You dare ask him for the sake of examination, not for the sake of exposing. Because if you want to expose as something else, right? If you want to show he's alive, but you asking, you want to weigh the evidences. Then this is kufr because you are automatically doubting the khatmun nubuwa of our Prophet. Just asking, can you imagine how about more than this? And that is why, brothers and sisters, every major book of aqidah ever written in the history of this ummah, it has within it that we Muslims believe that our Prophet وسلم, is Khatim al Anbiya wal Mursaleen. The first aqidah book, the book that is read across the Muslim world in Jamia Islamia, where I stand. Studied, in Al Azhar, in Deoban, in Darul Ulum, in every single university in the world, the major textbook, Aqidah Tahawiyyah. In Aqidah Tahawiyyah, explicit phrase, explicit point that the Prophet is the final Prophet, Khatim al Anbiya wal Mursaleen. And anybody who claims otherwise is a Kadhab, is a Batil, is somebody who's claiming Batil and falsehood, it shall be rejected of him. This is a mainstream belief. Another great theologian wrote, 1,100 years ago, Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi, he wrote a book called Usul al-Din. And I'm saying this because he wrote this before any modern fitna. Listen to what he had to say. 1,100 years ago, he wrote this around 400 Hijra. We are now in 1444. He wrote this around actually 390, 400 Hijra. He wrote that everybody who believes in the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has agreed that he is the Khatam wal anbiya wal Mursaleen and that the Sharia that of his will last forever and nobody will come to abrogate it. And this concept is mutawatir in the Quran and the Sunnah. Then listen to this. 
So whoever rejects the evidence of the Quran and Sunnah, فَهُوَ الْكَافِرُ Not فَقَدْ كَفَرْ فَهُوَ الْكَافِرُ There is no kufr worse than this kufr. فَهُوَ الْكَافِرُ He is the essence of kafir. This is what Al-Baghdadi is saying before any modern firqa, before any modern group. He's writing this 1,100 years ago. Anybody who claims nubuwa after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And by the way, Al-Baghdadi, his book is a compound violation of the diverse beliefs of the Ummah. The Shia said this, the Zaydi said this, the Khadijah said this, and generally he will just narrate. But when he comes to this point, he goes, no, this is the red line. As I said, we want to prove, we want to have as many people as possible, especially mainstream Sunnism, but we have to have red line. And he rarely pronounced the verdict, but when he comes to this issue, he goes, no. Anybody who claims in Nubuwa after our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that person is the essence of Kufr. And I find it amazing, brothers and sisters, that in the course of our Ummah, indeed we've had dozens of claimants of Nubuwa, dozens of them throughout Islamic history, beginning with Musaylama, you know, up until our modern times, not a single one of them, without exception, in pre-modernity was successful. They lived, they claimed prophethood, they died, and that's it. We don't have a single remnant of any of those Dajjalun around to this day. Allahumma accept for one or two that have appeared in modern times. When the world is different and, you know, colonialism came and the nation state came and different things came in the modern times. The only time we have actually had to deal with a viable, a tangible group of people who are increasing in number and who have a prophet after the prophet system. Otherwise, in the past, these people were literally like fluttering in the wind. They come, they go, nobody even remembers them except in books of heresy. Books of, you know, aqidah, they mention, oh, this guy used to live, that guy used to live. As for, unfortunately, in modern times, there are one or two such movements, and I will mention primarily one, but before I get there, especially for America, we need to be aware of one more, and that is the Nation of Islam, which has a lot to do with American Islamic history. The Nation of Islam is, of course, uh, uh, a syncretic movement, a movement that has elements of Islam, but elements of other ideologies. It was founded here in America, in Detroit, in the 1930s, and uh, the Nation of Islam uh, claimed that, astaghfirullah, I'm just quoting them, I know it's kufr to say this, but uh, it's kufr to believe this, but it's not kufr to say it, I'm teaching you what they believe. They believe that Allah Allah Azza wa Jal, Jalla Jalaluhu, astaghfirullah, came to America in the form of a human being. They believe that Allah, astaghfirullah, they say this, claim, they claim he came to Detroit and Chicago in the form of a human being. And that human being, his name was Fard Muhammad. Fard Muhammad. And Fard Muhammad taught Islam to the African-American lost Asiatic community. And this person, Elijah Muhammad, was chosen to be the prophet of Allah. And so Elijah Muhammad founded the Nation of Islam in the early 30s. In the 50s and 60s, it became a national movement. Maybe a million people followed it. And it became very famous for reasons beyond the scope of our talk today. Massive a number of converts and especially famous converts, right? Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, Karim Abdul Jabbar, Malcolm X. All of these people began converting to uh, this Nation of Islam. Then Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, his son, his son, Wadid Din Muhammad, after his father died, his son, Son, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for him. Jazahullahu khair. He engineered and maneuvered, maneuvered the movement to come into mainstream Islam. Alhamdulillah, slowly but surely he did. And so the bulk of them came to mainstream Islam. And so these are the followers of uh, Imam Wadid Din Muhammad, and they're a part of our mainstream community. Unfortunately, when he moved them back, one of the students of Elijah Muhammad, Louis Farahan, broke away from Wadid Din and said, We're going to go back to the original. Louis Farrakhan, Farrakhan, well-known name, he went back to the original. And so there's a very small group now still of the nation of Islam who believe in this ideology. When they say there is no God but Allah, by Allah they mean Fard Muhammad. And when they say Muhammad is his messenger, they mean Elijah Muhammad. And of course, for our standards, this is outside the fold of Islam. In any case, this movement is now barely 10, 20,000. And Elijah Muhammad is, I think, 90, uh, sorry, um, Farah Khan is, I think, 90 years old, and I predict that when he leaves this earth, 
his movement is going to fizzle out completely. So we don't, and, and I'm sure most of you have never met anybody of this movement anyway. It's going to also go where the previous movements went. This leaves us with one movement, and that will be the talk of the next bit. Wallahu musta'an, may Allah protect me and all of you. Because again, this movement has done dastardly tactics, and I'll mention one or two of them. The other movement, of course, is one that I feel, especially our youth, they are very unaware of. And in the last few years, this movement has risen up, especially in North America, and they are actively involved in taking over positions of journalism and positions of influence, and they're getting involved in mainstream organizations representing Islam without mentioning their real identity. What is their real identity? They are the followers of somebody called Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, from the village of Qadian in Punjab. So this Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, uh, they call themselves Ahmadis or Ahmadiyya, and the rest of the world calls them Qadianis. And this movement, it, it has many things, but one of the things you need to be aware of, it exaggerates its numbers to astronomical amounts. I read on their official website today, they claim they are more than 1% of the global ummah. Wallahi, what a laugh. 1% of the ummah. They claim that, that's, that would literally mean 20, 30, 40 million. And most academics and statistics would probably say they are two, three hundred thousand at max. They are not that much. So understand, in quantity, they're very few. They love to lie about their numbers and inflate their numbers that we are everywhere. All you have to do is look around. How many masajid do they have? Very few. But the problem is in the last few years, they have begun an aggressive campaign against the rest of us. An aggressive campaign that we should be accepted or else. And what is that or else? I'm going to get to in a while. And they are now, I, I don't have a better word for this. They are... I'm trying to be polite here. They don't, they don't be honest about who they are. Let me use say this, right? They don't claim that they are followers of this man until they infiltrate your group, until they become involved, and then they start slowly talking to people on the side. And this tactic is not good. Be honest. Be open. And we will treat you lakum dinukum waliyadin. We will treat you like a person of another faith, give you the rights. But when you're going to deceive, and when you're going to use tactics that are going to be harmful, then we have to call you out and expose you. And that's why, and again, in the last few weeks and months I've been traveling, many communities, communities I go to, their leaders come and tell me this happened, this happened, this happened. And this is now, I have to say, this seems to be a concerted tactic. They're trying to do this across and therefore I have to call them out. And we have to give the, again give the caveat, we're not astaghfirullah calling for violence, we're not calling for anything physical, but we have to speak the truth. So for our youth here, very quickly, who is this person, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, and what did he preach? Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was born in Punjab in India, and he came to age at the time when the British had kicked out the Mughal Empire and established themselves as the rulers of India. So he saw this firsthand as a young man. He was probably in the teenager's years when the Mughals were kicked out and the British were installed in India. Mirza Ghulam himself never went through any formal training. He didn't go to any madrasa. He didn't memorize the Quran. He doesn't have any formal training. As a young man, he began debating the Christian missionaries in his area. And he established a reputation for himself. This was his rise to fame. And brothers and sisters, one of the most corruptive factors for your niyyah is fame. One of the most corruptive factors is the desire to be in the spotlight. Wallahu al-musta'an. May Allah protect all of us and give us ikhlas. He tasted fame. He became a person who was traveling, debating the British missionaries, debating the Christian missionaries. And he carved out for himself, you know, a type of reputation that deceived a lot of people in his time. But then, slowly but surely, when he saw this, he began modifying his message. Rather than concentrating on debating Christians and proving Islam, he began saying things about himself. And it was gradual. He began by saying that he is the mujaddidu al-asr. The mujaddid of the entire time frame. Right? He is the mujaddid of the whole ummah. And then he upgraded. He is the muhaddath, the term that he used. Muhaddath means Allah gives me ilham. Ilham is a type of wahi that, that we will say it is, 
it is allowed because it's not direct wahi, but no one should claim I'm getting ilham. You don't know if you're getting ilham. You know, our Prophet ﷺ said that uh, Umar ibn Khattab, Allah gives him ilham. Ilham is like an intuition. Ilham is like Allah gifted you intuition. But we say this intuition, it might be a gift from Allah, but you don't know until you act upon it and alhamdulillah it turned turn to be true. You cannot say Allah is giving me intuition. If Allah gives us a gift, it's like a karama, it's like a, a mini miracle. If Allah gives you a gift, but you cannot demand, you cannot say I am that person. But he began to say, Allah is giving me this ilham. Then he began preaching the doctrine that Jesus Christ, the Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam, had actually been saved from the cross and traveled from Jerusalem to India, mashallah. And he came to Punjab and he died in Kashmir. So he be began claiming, and by the way, they have a grave there that they think is the holiest grave, and they visit it to this day. And they say this is the grave of Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus Christ. So they claim Isa is buried in Kashmir. And he began to claim that the second coming of Jesus is not this Jesus because he's dead, but rather a figure shall be chosen and raised up by Allah and he shall be the second Jesus in spirit, not in name. His name will not be Jesus, but he shall be the second Jesus. And then of course he claimed that is himself. He called himself Al-Masih Al-Maw'ud. I am the promised Messiah. So now he began claiming, I am the promised Masih. And then the final thing, and this is very explicit, he upgraded, it's a con constant upgrade, constant upgrade, right? I am Mujaddid, I am Muhaddath, I am Masih al Mawud. What's left? Nubuwa. And he began claiming. But he did this very gradually, by the way. Firstly, he began, because see, again, he didn't say this in the beginning of his message. Took him a solid 10, 20 years, developing bit by bit. He began saying that Muslims have misunderstood the concept of Nubuwa. He said, Nubuwa is an open door and it remains until the day of judgment. Okay, Mirza Ghulam, I just recited, Ma kana Muhammadun Aba Ahmed wa Khatam al Nabiin. What do you say? Listen to how the twist happens. Yes, the Prophet has the Khatam in his hand, metaphorically, and he can stamp Nubuwa on anybody he wants. He literally flipped the script. This is not what you understand from Arabic. But he said, the Prophet ﷺ is the one who can stamp somebody with Nubuwa. And so Nubuwa can remain after the Prophet ﷺ, but the Prophet ﷺ will choose it. And then he gave caveats. This Nubuwa will not be like the Prophet ﷺ's Nubuwa. No, it's going to be less than his. It's not going to be a new Sharia. No, it's going to be the same Sharia but it will be an actual nubuwa. And I have quotations that I have looked up because again, I mean, I, I hope that inshallah you know me by now that I try to be very academic. I don't listen to, you know, rumors. I don't listen to, I want to go to the source. I want to see exactly, you know, what this is. So I read a number of books and articles. I, I even got some books of, of this group so that I have it. I have them in the library and I want to make sure. So he says, um, pardon my Urdu here. جس دین میں نبوت کا سلسلہ نہیں ہے تو وہ مردہ دین ہے جس دین میں نبوت کا سلسلہ نہیں ہے تو وہ مردہ دین ہے any nation that doesn't have a live concept of prophecy is a dead nation you see he's setting the stage right you see he's setting the stage for himself that prophecy has to be live you must have a prophet and then slowly but surely he then said that he is that prophet. And he said that I am never going to be equal to the sun, the, the, br the bright sun of the Prophet. I am the shadow behind him. I am in his zil. I am in the zil of Muhammad, but I am a Nabi. And I, I quote you from his book. This is his book, Tuhfat al Nadwa. This was a Tuhfa of Ulama al Nadwa. He, ulama al Nadwa refuted him, Tuhfat al Nadwa. I'm going to reply to you, Tuhfat al-Nadwa. And again, pardon my Urdu, but listen to this carefully. Ye kalam jo mein sunata hoon, qat'i aur yaqini tawr pe khuda ka kalam hai. 
یہ میں جو آپ سے کلام بات کر رہا ہوں دا اسپیچ ایم گونگ یو قطعی اور یقینی طور پہ خدا کا کلام ہے جیسے قرآن اور تھوڑا خدا کا کلام ہے وٹ ایم گونگ یو آف دیز ریولیشن کز یو سی ہی ہیڈ ریولیشن ہی ہیڈ یعنی یو نو ہی کلیم دیز ریولیشن بائی دا وے ان فارسی ان اردو ان ویری بروکن انگلش اینڈ ان کمپلیٹلی بروکن عربک ہی ہیڈ آل فور لینگویجز رائٹ Farsi and Urdu, I cannot judge, but I can judge the English you can see. And the, as for the Arabic, unbelievable mistakes of a grade one level. Because he never studied Arabic, okay? So he says that this kalam that I'm giving you, yaqini torpe, qat'i torpe, it is definitive that this is the kalam of Allah. Just like the Quran or Torah, khuda ka kalam hai, and I'll listen to this. Or ma khuda ka zilli or buruzi tors par nabi hu. And I am Khuda Katorse Zilli. I am the shadow prophet of Allah. And the Buruzi prophet of Allah means I am the one that yani Allah has caused to come out behind the light of the Prophet. And then he says that any Muslim who does not listen to me has committed kufr. You have to follow me or else you are a kafir. So now. He declared himself to be a Nabi, but he always would say, but not like that Nabi. I am a Nabi, Zilli Nabi. I'm a shadow Nabi, meaning I am eclipsed by the Prophet Sallallahu but I am a Nabi. And in 1900 CE, so 123 years ago, he wrote a book, Angrezi Government or Jihad. This is the title of the book, right? The British Government and Jihad. And in this book, He claimed that Allah has told him that jihad is no longer valid and you should not fight the British and you must obey the rule of the British. And he says, and this is on page 11 and 18, that, O oh, ulama and molvis, meri baat suno, listen to me. I am telling you this is not the time for jihad against the British. Do not disobey Allah's messenger. This is what he is saying. Don't fight the British. at a time when even Hindus now want to fight. They want independence, right? Hindus are starting, Muslims are starting. We're tired of British rule. This guy comes along and goes, listen to Allah ki Nabi, meaning who? Meaning who? Himself. Listen to Allah ki Nabi. This is the hukum of Allah's Nabi. Don't fight the British. You can understand whose interests are being served by this. And this is literally from his book. The awaited Messiah has arrived and orders you to abstain from all war. Very clear. And I've read this myself in the book. It is translated to English, by the way. The book is translated to English. From their website, you can download it. And as I said, he began making proclamations that he has a book. And this book, as I said, is revealed in multiple uh, languages. So I have this book. I had to get it because I want to make sure that I'm speaking the you know, accurate truth. So it's around a thousand pages um, of commentary and book together. And I got it from their, uh, from their own publication so that I don't get uh, you know, a, a filtered one. So honestly, and I don't know how else to say this, I can't read the Urdu that well. The translation is there. But in terms of Arabic, it's a complete failure. complete failure. So he has, for example, and every Arabic phrase of his, it is basically a hodgepodge of Quranic verses or a few phrases that you would learn by asking somebody. One of the revelations he has, this is his Quran. This is, by the way, it's called a tadhkira He called his Quran a tadhkira And you can find it. This is the name of his book, tadhkira a tadhkira He said, Inni ma'aka wa ma'a ahlika wa ma'a kulli man ahabbak. Allah is speaking to him. Inni ma'aka, I am with you. وَمَعَ أَهْلِكَ And I'm with your family, his wife and his children. وَمَعَ كُلَّ مَنْ أَحَبَّكَ And I'm with everybody who loves you. And he says that Allah said to him, I'm just literally quoting you, تَأْتِيكَ نُصْرَةِ يَأْتِيكَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجْنْ عَمِيقٍ This is what he said is Allah's revelation. تَأْتِيكَ نُصْرَةِ يَأْتِيكَ Shouldn't be the two different verses. But anyway, تَأْتِيكَ نُصْرَةِ يَأْتِيكَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجْنْ عَمِيقٍ My help will come to you. My help will come to you from every single deep valley. Allah says, the hujjaj are going to come min kulli fajjin amiq. And so he said, Allah's help is going to come min kulli fajjin amiq. And this is one of his surahs, dated September 29, 1905. Okay, I'm reciting straight from, I literally copied and pasted from the book so that you know that I'm not making this up. It's 
Astaghfirullah, seven verses, six verses. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive me, but I have to, Wallah, I have to teach you. Please understand. You understand. We are just saying this so you understand. La takhaf. Inni la yakhafu ladayya al-mursaloon. If you know your Quran, the second half is the Quran, right? وَقَالُوا مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ هَيْهَاتَ هَيْهَاتَ لِمَا تُعَدُونَ This is the second verse. Literally, he took two verses of the Quran, made another verse. Now listen to this. قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ ذُو الْإِقْتِدَارِ I don't know what that is. أَفَلَا تُؤْمِنُونَ And then he says, قُلْ عِنْدِي شَهَادَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ This is verse number four. قُلْ مَا أَزِيدُ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِي وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ إِنَّا أَنْزَنَوْا فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ إِنَّا كُنَّا مُزِّلِينَ End of the surah. Wallahi, akhi, if you feel this. I, I, I'm trying to be academic here, but يعني, you go ahead and read it yourself. It is clear that he doesn't know Arabic. And he's cutting and pasting verses from the Quran and adding a word here and there. And then because he's in 1905, whatever in India, people don't know any better, you know. And so this is now, but the sad thing is, the crazy thing is, this is preserved and his followers still read this. His followers think this is his revelation. This is his, yani, what Allah has revealed to him. In any case, to go on, and inshallah we just have 5-10 minutes left. His movement really was a massive failure within Really it was. They like to exaggerate. Come on, show me how many masajid are there in India, in Pakistan. Be real. These people exaggerate their numbers. It was a dismal failure. And so, early on in the 1900s, they got the idea that we need to spread our movement amongst non-Muslims. And they began to send active missionaries in Africa, in Europe, and in America. And so this is a different facet of history. Because of this, many people converted to th their understanding because they didn't know any better. They didn't know what is Islam. And their preachers come along and they preach 80-90% mainstream and then they add the 10%. That is Ghulam Mirza and this and that. Okay, many actually Christians in England converted. They didn't know any better. They're hearing Tawheed. They're hearing, you know, they get the real Quran in their hands. They read it. They appreciate it. But then they say, oh, but you must believe in the Messiah, the, uh, the you know, Ghulam Mirza, whatnot. And so many people did convert. And here in America, in 1922, one of the students of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, by the name of Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, he entered America illegally, uh, got a wrong visa, and he preached in Chicago and Detroit and other areas. And then he was was kicked out he was expelled because he didn't have the right visa now here is where the plot really thickens this is really interesting let's go back to the nation of islam who was their god what was his name fard muhammad for the longest time nobody knew who fard muhammad was his mystery remained, uh, his identity remained a mystery because he was actually caught embezzling and stealing, thrown into jail, and then deported. This was their God, okay? That's why we have mug shots. I'm not making this up. We have mug shots of their God because he was in San Quentin prison. I'm not making this up. Because he was caught faking a check and embezzling and fraud. And because he was an immigrant, so then they kicked him out. Because they kicked him out, now we don't know much about him, where he went, where he ended up. It's all a mystery. One of our uh, uh, sisters, Sister Fatima Fanusi, she did a PhD from Howard University about Fard Muhammad. The most, this is I think five, six years ago, recently, like not that long ago. The most comprehensive doctoral dissertation about Fard Muhammad. And what she uncovered was literally mind-boggling even though everything fits. Fard Muhammad was a missionary from the Ahmadi movement. Fard Muhammad was a missionary that was sent by the Ahmadi movement after the failure of Sadiq Khan, but he decided he's going to go impromptu, he's going to go rogue, he's going to make something different. And he gave this cocktail hodgepodge, which actually caught on. And Elijah Muhammad then took it to a whole different level even. And then the nation of Islam began. Therefore, we can factually state the nation of Islam 
actually has its origins from the Ahmadi or the Qadiani movement. And what also shows this from the beginning of its inception, their official translation was the translation of Muhammad Ali, who is the uh, Ahmadi who translated the Quran. Uh, he was the only Ahmadi who translated the Quran. That was adopted by the movement. Now, back to Mirza Ghulam, and then we'll finish. Of course, many scholars refuted him. Many scholars pointed out his deviancy. The most famous incident that our children need to know. One of the great muhaddithin and scholars of India, Sheikh Sanaullah Al-Amritsari. Al-Amritsari. Sheikh Sanaullah Al-Amritsari. He was a muhaddith, a scholar, a professor of hadith and teacher and alim. He had multiple debates and, and uh, writings back and forth public until finally in 1907, in 1907, he issued a challenge. And this challenge was put in the newspaper. He said, may Allah's la'na be upon the, one of the two of us who is lying. Whoever I am saying, the Prophet is the last Prophet. You are saying you are the Prophet. May Allah's la'na come on whoever is lying and may he die a death in the lifetime of the other. This is my la'na, mubahala is called. This is my mubahala. I am invoking Allah's curse on the liar. And I'm saying that let the liar die in the lifetime of the other person. And he published this, that khalas, let it be. That is what you call Iman. But subhanAllah, that's truth as well. And barely a few months after publishing this letter, in 1908, Mirza Ghulam got struck with cholera and he died an ignoble death. And Sheikh Sanaullah al Amritsari lived another 40 years, migrated to Pakistan, lived in Pakistan, then died in Pakistan. 40 years Allah wanted to show. Who is the two of these two is the liar. In any case, some points here as well you should be aware of. One thing you should be aware of, um, Muhammad Iqbal, the great alama, the, the philosopher, when he was younger, he didn't see the truth of this movement, so he wrote some praise about them. And the Qadianis love to quote this. However, in his later years, when he became aware, he wrote an entire book, Qadianis and Orthodox Muslims. That's one of the books of, of, of Alama Iqbal. And in that book, he said, these people are a fifth column, beware of them. These people are traitors, beware of them. So anybody who quotes you, Allama Iqbal, you tell him, this is when he was younger, he didn't see through. When he got older and he saw the reality, he distanced himself. Allama Rashid Rida, Al-Manar, the, 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 the great alim of, of, of um, Egypt. Allama Rashid Rida multiple times wrote fatwas against this while the guy's alive. And then when his son and his movement is rising up in the 1910s and 20s, he wrote them. The Sheikh of Al-Azhar was asked about this, uh, Bahjat or something, he was asked about this firqa. And he goes, this is a firqa that has outside the fold of Islam. And multiple ulama continue to say, this is a firqa. We don't consider it a firqa within the ummah. It is another deen. It's not one of the 73 firqas, it is outside of the deen. I want to say this because these guys claim that this is something modern. You guys are saying we're outside the ummah. No! Allama Iqbal said this. Rashid Rida said this. The Mufti of Azhar said this. This is in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. This sentiment remained then in the 50s and 60s. Uh, many Pakistanis are aware. The first foreign minister that was appointed was from this group. The first foreign minister of the country, Zafarullah, Zafarullah Khan, Zafarullah Khan? No, no. Yeah, Zafarullah. Yeah, it is Zafarullah Khan, right? Muhammad Zafarullah Khan, I think. Something like this, yeah. The first foreign minister that was appointed was from this group. Because he was from this group, so many ulama of Pakistan, the Deobandis, the Tablighis, Jamaat, Maududi wrote a book about this, right? That we cannot have this person representing us, going to the UN. This is not our culture, our deen. And he's writing, he was very, very active preacher about this movement. He tr he's the one who translated Tadkira, by the way. That Quran of his, translated by, yeah, it is Zafarullah Khan, yeah, Muhammad Zafarullah Khan, yeah. He translated the Tadkira. So this was an active preacher. So the Pakistani community, the Pakistani nation began rallying up. We have to declare these people, they're not Muslim. And so a constitutional you know, uh, meeting was called and convened and the constitutional amendment was made by the government of Pakistan that we will not consider this movement to be a Muslim movement. So it is now in the constitution of the country. These guys say, 
what right does the constitution of a country have? What right do politicians have to declare us kuffar? We say, we don't care about politicians. The kalima declares you outside the fold. We don't care. I'm being honest here. I don't care if the constitution did it or not. I don't need the constitution of a country to say this. The ulama said this. The, all the ulama said this. And then after this, they try to still get themselves accepted. Subhanallah. The Rabbit al Alam al Islami, the largest and the most global body of Muslims, convened a conference in the late 70s, 77, 78, in Mecca. And they made an official decree by unanimous consensus of all 300 plus ulama around the world. These are the senior ulama of every country, every firqa, every madhab that is mainstream. They came together, not a single dissenting voice that any group, including this one, they mentioned by name, who believes in nubuwa after the Prophet wasallam, is not a part of this ummah. They are outside this ummah. Now, to conclude, brothers and sisters, one of the tactics of this group, and I have been the victim of this as well, is that they viciously attack you, smear you, publicly try to make a big deal about the fact that you are considering them non-Muslims. And they will link you to violence around the world. They will mention something, oh, this mob happened and it killed one of our people. You know, this person shot one of our people. And this sheikh in Dallas, or that sheikh, he is the one calling for this as well by saying that this group is outside the fold of Islam. And one of their guys, their journalists, when Islamophobia was at its peak, remember 10 years ago, how bad it was here? Remember when the government was going berserk and people were passing? In that time frame, one of these people mentioned me and Sheikh Umar and others by name, and he goes, these people, at the time we were rising up, we were getting very famous. These people, they are literally, he called us soft ISIS terrorists. Can you imagine? And he published this in a newspaper as a journalist, because he's a journalist. He goes, don't be deceived. These ulama of mainstream Sunnism, you, you think they're anti-jihad. No, these are the worst jihadists. Can you imagine in that time frame, article comes out and mentions you're a secret jihadist. Why? What violence did I call for? Because he says the Qadianis are not Muslim. So look, they take a statement that we have our definition and they accuse you of being a terrorist. And this is now unfortunately becoming mainstream in this regard. And by the way, how ironic, their founder is the biggest takfiri in the entire ummah because he said, any Muslim who doesn't believe in me is what? Is a kafir. He made takfir of the entire ummah. So who are you to then tell us anything? Even if you're 1%, we're making takfir of your 1%. Your founder made takfir of 99.999% of the ummah. The irony. In any case, khair, I want to finish off over here. That, especially to our youth. Listen, we are not preaching astaghfirullah, any violence. I'm being very clear here. And wallahi, I'll be honest with you. If these types of attacks take place, vigilante, quote-unquote, justice, we have to speak out against it. They are human beings. They deserve the right to be educated, the right to go to hospital, the right to have jobs. But I have one simple request upon them. Very simple. Stop disguising yourselves and stop deceiving the rest of us. Say to the rest of the world, we are followers of Mirza Ghulam. Say that. And wallahi, if you say it, lakum deenukum waliyadeen. And I will say, yes, go get education. Yes, go get a job. Yes, go and live your lives. But when you say that you are a Muslim and when you accuse me of being a terrorist or a kafir because I don't acknowledge you no I'm sorry you are being duplicious you're being deceptive and this group I mean I have a message for them I'm being inshallah I'm not trying to be harsh here but you have been trying for 140 years to be accepted by the ummah you have been trying for 140 years to become mainstream not a single alim in the history of this ummah has ever welcomed you. Why do you want to enter a building that is sealed shut against you? Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, it is truly amazing that when it comes to this issue, Sunni and Shia, you know, Barelvi and Deobandi, Salafi and Sufi, Zaidi and Ibadi, we all come together. We all unite and we say, in spite of all our differences, you guys are not welcome here. There is no 
no Nabi after our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I say to those people, give up on your false battle to try to be accepted. For Wallahi, 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 as long as there is blood in our veins, as long as our tongues say the kalima, we shall never ever respect the Dajjal and a Kadhab as long as we live. You want to be treated as humans? We'll treat you as humans. But lakum deenukum waliya deen. You have your deen, I have my deen. Don't pretend that you're a part of our deen when no one within our deen wants you to be a part of our deen. If you're not deceptive, if you're honest, if you're public, then you shall get my support to be a human being. It's my support to live a life that is free, that is as you are. Lakum deenukum waliya deen. But when you are deceptive and you try to fool and you try to propagate and infiltrate, I must point out the double standards. I must call you out for your hypocrisy and I must say a thousand times I must say we shall never compromise on this position. We shall never give up the khatmun nubuwa. We have lines to draw and this is a red line that shall never be crossed. La nabiyya ba'di. There shall never be a nabi after our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be brave and firm on this and protect us from the tactics of our enemies. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَالصَّابِرَاتِ وَالْخَاشِعِينَ وَالْخَاشِعَاتِ والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما